Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, welcome, uh, everyone. And part two of our conversation. How do I close that window? Hold on a second. Yeah, close it. Yay. No, Miriam Margot. Is that how you like to be addressed by both names? Miriam? Um, it, uh, Miriam in Jewish settings would be great. <laughs> okay, terrific. Um, original sound is not on. And it's not going to be on because this is not my computer and I could not figure out how to make it show up. And uh, I tried in all the ways that I know how to do it, but it wouldn't show up. So like I said, I'm, I'm like in the, what's the outer limits? I am not in control here. Already. Zoom is saying the host locked the meeting. Is that something that you can deal with, Deborah, on your end? Judy Rakusin can't get in, but you all got here, so I don't know what's going on. Um, ask her to try again. If anybody has Judy Rakusin's phone number, would you please um, would you please text her and ask her to try again? Tonight, part two of Oz of Alan Liu of Blessed Memory. Yeah, and Gail Garland can't get in either. Zoom says I locked the meeting, but clearly I didn't. Oh, wait a second. It says locked up here. Oh, yeah, yeah. Never again. Uh, we should have just canceled tonight. How do I unlock the meeting if it says locked up top, Miss um, PC, Deborah Lesk? You're muted. This is all being recorded, too, so it's for posterity. I and just enabled the waiting room. I un I enabled the way. Oh, lock meeting. Here, I'll just get rid of it. I can okay, do that. that there, I did it. All right. So talk amongst yourselves again, because I need to tell these people to try again. Wait, where's my phone? I hear, I hear. I'm Someone's good. calling me. All right. <laughs> this All right. is part two, as I was saying. Gail Garland, welcome. Uh, then we're going to uh, delve into chapter two of Alan Liu's book on Teshuvah. And um, we're actually going to stay on the topic. Uh, I'm trying to figure out whether or not we should just delve completely into Shuvah for the remaining weeks, uh, approaching Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. Um, but um, certainly we'll deal with these chapters on Rosh Hashanah before Rosh Hashanah, as well as um, uh, skipping ne ne the next chapter, which is on Tisha B'Av. So, but you should read it in order to have a c context of where we've been and where we are going. Okay. So Teshuva, what does it mean? The word. Now he, he, he jumps in with that right away. And he admits that we don't really have a, um, a definitive definition for teshuva, we call it repentance, we call it return. I'm on page 19, and I'm in the Kindle version, and um, if it differs, if anybody's in the book, uh, please let us know. We call it a turning, it is all of these things and none of these things. If I was, um, if I had all my, you know, my hardware and my apps with me, I would screen share the word itself, because the word itself points to a Shuv, a, a turning in the word. If you look at the word teshuva, shuv, he, return to the letter he, right? And he, of course, is Hashem. Yud, he, vav, he. He is the breath. He is the blessing that naturally occurs when we breathe. Um, it is our prayer. And so returning um, is uh, kind of like a the difficult concept returning to what returning to where returning to who um and um i'm going to be unpacking that um if not next week the week after uh, by looking at some teachings from uh rav cook of blessed memory the first the chief rabbi of palestine who um wrote an amazing uh piece called Orotas Teshuva, The Light of Teshuva. Um, one thing that, um, that uh, Alan Liu does not talk about um, in this chapter, I, if I remember correctly, 
He doesn't talk about the, the things that were built into reality, into creation, before creation began. So um, does anybody know what any of those things are according to Midrash? And uh, we'll cover this in a, in a future week. But does anyone know um, one of the things that um, was created before creation itself that is in the DNA, that is in the hard drive of reality? Raise your hand virtually or real, really for sure. There's not that many of us. I can see everybody. Anybody? Okay. Oh, Miriam, please make yourself um, at home. Great to have you. <laughs> <laughs> but besides Teshuvah, there's the mouth of the donkey. There was the well. There was the, the worm. The... Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so the number of things. Um, and we just had the Parshat uh, Balak a couple of weeks ago. Um, the mouth of the donkey was one of the things that was, or we can call it preordained, or we can, you know, I think Reb Zalman, uh, would be happy if we called it built into the hard drive of, uh, of this, this reality that we know. By the way, if you're ever looking, and I've mentioned this before, it's for an amazing read of a, of a midrash written by a, um, a Jewish uh, scientist. Um, it's called uh, Mr. G. And he didn't intend it to be a, a midrash, um, and his name is escaping me right now, but I know one of you will Google him very quickly. Um, it's uh, just an amazingly um, imaginative foray into the mind of divinity before there was a before, and the conversations that divinity was having with God's self, along with some very fun and funny characters that are along with um, God for the ride, thus Mr. G. So we call it a turning as all of these things and none of these things it is a word that points us to the realm beyond language, to the realm of pure motion and form. As always, please, if I um, cover something here that you will have a comment about, um, just holler and uh, so we get your two shekels in as well. I like to, as I said last week, talk, uh, treat this as a conversation more as uh, than a, um, a straight ahead you know, teaching, you know, that I'm downloading anything, but uh, it takes a village here. Meira, welcome. Good to see you. This is uh, a journey home. And every time he uses that uh, expression that we're coming, it's a coming home, um, I can't help but just feel delighted that the name of our Sidor that we created is Finding Our Way Home. Um, sometimes I think of our journeys that we are salmon, you know, swimming upstream, um, and eventually we are all going to reach that place where we um, have been entrusting our souls in every night. Right? And I leave a low ira, and someday actually uh, we're not going to wake up, <laughs> and uh, we're going to return to the source. <clears throat> And of course, Alan Lou alludes to it in this chapter too, that Yom Kippur is kind of like a, it is a, what, a, um, a rehearsal, a rehearsal for our deaths. And uh, so as we talk about Teshuvah as well, we can keep that in mind too, because uh, the, the, the intense days of Elul leading through Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur, uh, if we have been really working at it, then on uh, Yom Kippur, Yom Kippur is going to feel really like the day of cleansing that it is, the day that atones for all. Why? He, he says, why do we, he says that we have to leave our homes to find our way home and then leave again. So he um, he's alluding up to, uh, of course, Avram Avinu, uh, Abraham, our father, um, but uh, I think that's kind of interesting for each of us personally, if we take a look at, of course, the 42 steps on our journey that we cover in Parshat Maseh, um, that uh, we have to leave home to find our way back home. Um, I, I can only imagine that um, some of you have experienced that in your life, that there is, you know, we have to go out and journey uh, before we can um, discover our, 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 our full true nature. and. We need to use the process of the shuvah of, of, of to prune away 
that which is not only extraneous, but we've picked up along the road. Imagine that um, uh, our cars you have splash guards, and without the splash guards, all of that mud and yuck and dirt from the road would splash up underneath the car. And you can't see it unless you get the car, put the car up, you know, and your, your mechanic has it. Well, we might think of teshuva in that way as well as it being the splash guards of it, um, of, of when we are in the constant process of doing teshuva, we are lizmur, we are we're, we're pruning away at those things which are keeping the light from shining most fully to, to us and through us. How to do teshuva is going to be in for another day. So we're not talking about the hows today, um, and some of you have your own practices, I'm sure, as well as I, and we'll share those as the week weeks go on, but just what teshuva is, um, is uh, the, the beginning of that topic for tonight, which we will continue. Oh, Bigfoot is here. <laughs> whoever, that, whoever that is. Right. Oh, I forget height. <laughs> I forget that it was you. Alrighty, page 20. He's talking about the secure, the circular nature of the calendar. And uh, maybe next week, again, I don't have all my toys with me tonight. Um, he's he's going to talk about uh, Rav Joseph Soloveitchik and the amazing way that he looks at, you know, a circle. And that when you start out on a, a circumference of a circle, it looks like you're getting farther and farther from where you started. But in fact, one might look at it and, and in the opposite way, that we're getting the, the, the moment we leave our home, the moment we leave that spot at the top of the circumference of the circle, we're already returning home around the circle. Um, so think of the uh, Jewish calendar in that week. Reb Sarah, welcome. I hope you're feeling better, my dear friend. Nowhere is more evident than Durham on page 20 in the middle. The Jewish sacred calendar, the sacred year, embodies the essential paradox of this homeward journey. Nowhere is this more evident than during the months surrounding the high holidays, the quarter of the year that begins in midsummer with Tisha B'Av, uh, morning of the destruction of the temple, and other things, of course, that moves through the high holidays himself, period of intense self-revelation, purification, and ends with Sukkot, the time of great rejoicing, when we erect a house that's not really a house, a home that's not really a home, a time when we seem to have come to the end of a journey only to begin it again. So we begin in order, we, we, the, every ending has a beginning. And I think there's a quote from, uh, from Alice in Alice in Wonderland about the, the minute that you leave, it's only the, begin, the start of the beginning, right? And so we have so many of those. Um, on our calendar, of course, we, uh, we mark many of those times that we begin um, again, over and over. We have four New Year's, <laughs> right? So there are four times in which there's kind of like a re-ignition of, um, of our, our, our relationship with, with divinity, our relationship with nature, our relationship with each other, our relationship with ourselves. And the, and the seasons go round and round and the painted ponies go up and down, right? But I don't think we're captives on the carousel of time. Um, I think as Jews, we are very active participants in the carousel of time. And we are, we are God's partners in, you know, yes, lo alecha ham lecha more. It's not up to us to complete the task, but it's not, uh, but it's not for us to ignore what the work that we have to do in the, in the unique work that each of us has to do according to the, the imprint on our soul. Page 22. All right, so there is someone who is not here tonight. Good. I won't say who it is, but every time we start talking about baseball, he complains. Why all the baseball talk? Let's not talk about baseball. So whenever I reread this chapter by Al Lou, I realize, oh, I, Al Lou and I, we would have loved each other because he was a baseball fan as well. And Judy Rakusin has her hat on, right? I don't have my hair, Judy, but I do have my, my next keeper on, even though <laughs> we're Steven baseball. But we're getting closer to winning a game. <laughs> so I love this whole thing about um, that he that he talks about baseball on page twenty two is where I make the connection. Then he gets to more of it in depth. The dream of the lost home. 
The dream of the lost home must be one of the deepest of all human dreams. Certainly it is the most ancient dream of the Jewish people embodied in our national resolve to someday rebuild the Bayit, the home, the great temple in Yerushalayim. And this dream is the basis of that most profound expression of the American psyche, the game of baseball. All right, so you please forgive me, but Alan Liu, he's, he's, he's in the same ballpark as I am, pun intended. <laughs> Um, it is a game whose object is to leave home in order to return to it again, right? Transformed by the time spent circling the bases. So in the, in, in the Torah version of baseball, there are 42 bases, <laughs> right? And each one of those bases represents a stop along the way that where we encamp and then we learn something important and then we make off for the next encampment as well. But, uh, you know, baseball is a very Jewish sport and there's, there's whole books written about that. And uh, we will be having a Wednesday night about that after Sukkot when they're still playing the playoffs. And that famous shortstop Odysseus also played this game, propelled around the world by the same dream of returning home in the end, transformed by the journey and healed by it as well. Um, Reb Sandy, Reb Sarah, uh, I, I'm always struck when he starts talking about um, the, the things that happen in our journey that causes pain and that the journey itself embedded in there is what we need to heal. So you can't go around it. We have to immerse ourselves so to speak, in the calendar, in the same way that we have to immerse ourselves in whatever pain we're going through, so that we eventually that pain will tr will transform us and will be transformed by it. Does that make sense, Ripsara? It does, as I wear my splint. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting for Absolutely. the transformation, but yes, it does. Yeah, I, I, Zach took me on a. Um, the, the, I was quite jet lagged on Monday because, um, well, I was. And, uh, and so I said, Zach, my son said, where do, what do you want to do? And I said, uh, well, what do you want to do? He said, let's go for a hike. It's got to be really, really gentle, I said. So he found a gentle hike. And when we got to the, to the place where we were supposed to turn off, that was closed. We couldn't drive in. That road was closed. And so he said, well, there's a, a little longer hike. It's quite beautiful. And it's right on top of the ridge. And so we drove there. Let me just make a long story short. It was an eight mile hike. Yeah. Um, it, it was uh, all uphill. Um, when we got to the top, it was magnificent. There was a, 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 a large lake, but on the way back, it was all downhill. And I tripped over a tree, um, you know, a tree ah. root. And I went f literally off my feet flying into a, um, into to a tree stump and oh my, my God. with my hand. And um, talk about being transformed <laughs> at that moment. You know, sometimes, sometimes life just, just it seems like it's going in slow motion and there's That's nothing that you can do, right? Well, my hand, my thumb is all black and blue. Luckily, I didn't, uh, I didn't break it. It's just a bad bruise and I, could, I can play guitar. So all's well that ends well. Um, but... Um, you know, I was looking at it as like, why didn't, why didn't I get hurt, you know, worse than that? You know, I, something very, very bad could have happened. Um, yeah, I scraped my knee. Uh, I felt that maybe I had even um, uh, strained a ligament in behind, behind my knee. But, oh. um, you know, sometimes during this time of year, um, and as you get older, as we age, um, we, we get the feeling that Hashkacha Pratit is a real living thing, meaning um, that there's a divine protection in a way. Now I say that with a two, 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 because I don't want to put the, uh, you know, the, 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 the Hara on me, um, that something bad should have happen. But the fact that something worse didn't happen to me, um, is something that I'm going to be actually reflecting on during Elul. Um, and, uh, thinking a lot about, um, you know, the, the, all the aging and saging work that most of us have to do here, and um, and and how do I want to spend my time rounding the bases as I approach home? I don't know. Um, I'm 68. Where am I in Reb Zalman's book? Um, I guess I'm maybe in October 
or maybe late September, Reb Sarah, where, what's in this? You're, you're muted, September. Late it goes, September? September goes till 69. Oh, so I'm late, September okay, late September. Till 69. So I'm about to get to October and it's starting to get the leaves are starting to fall. And, I was, and so did I. Page um, 23. This is where I was alluding to before. Uh, for those of you who don't know the work of Rabbi Joseph Soloveitchik, um, it, uh, some of his work is uh, almost impenetrable. It's not easy reading. And that includes his book on Teshuvah. Um, but you might want to Google it and see um, some things that people have uh, pulled out from it to share. Um, Sorry, I just want to say it's uh, page 24 in the book. Ah, thank you, Bina. Teshuvah, turning, return, repentance is the central gesture of the holiday season. It is a circular motion. Rabbi Yosef Soloveitchik wrote in Ah Teshuvah, his classic work on the days of awe. If you're moving along the circumference of a circle, I alluded to this before, it might seem at first as if the starting point is getting farther away, but actually it's getting closer. So the calendar year is such a circle. Rosh Hashanah, the new year begins, um, and every day is one day farther from the starting point, but every day is also a return, a drawing closer. The biblical prophet Shmuel, Samuel, served the people of Israel in circuit every year, and every year he went from Ramah to Bethel to Gilgal to Mitzvah, and then finally back to Ramah again, Ramah, and the moment he left Ramah, he was already returning there. Everywhere he went, he was heading for home. I guess that's why when we're kids in the car, we say, are we home yet? You know, when are we going to get there? When are we going to get there? Um, I'm just curious, how many of you have uh, traditions that you grew up with of eating the head of a fish or something else in your households um, uh, for Rosh Hashanah? Because, of course, Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year. Uh, Dan Glazer, you're making a, a signal as if to say, no way, Jose. Is that okay? But did anybody have that? Um, for that practice. I didn't either. I was just curious if anybody here has. Mel Schnapper, welcome, Mel. You're here just in time for me to talk about baseball. <laughs> so, Rabbi Pell basically puts his finger on how time really flows. What we call teshuva is a primal gesture, a primordial sense of the healing power of the journey we make through life. The time spent circling the bases, Mel. Numbers express this in their natural and universal urge to return to one after 10. So let's stop here for a second and uh, reflect on this idea of every journey is a return, a return home. Um, anyone have anything you'd like to share about um, you know, the, the pull of the Yamim Noraim, the pull of the High Holy Days, uh, how it feels as we get closer to it, um, if there's an intensity to it, dependent upon the uh, the, the intensity of the work that uh, and the self instruction. You know, keep in mind that Elul is really personal stuff, and we'll be doing a lot of that work together as the weeks go by. But when we get to Rosh Hashanah and certainly Yom Kippur, it's all we, right? For the sins that we shechatanu. Lefanecha. It's there. These are not. It's it's a time to take a communal um, look, a communal reflection about where we are, and where we want to, to return to, where we hope to return to. Linda Landis, please. Hello. I hope the weather is better where you are than here. It was a hundred degrees today. Um, You're in Florida, so you can't. Yeah, I know. Comes with the territory. Yes, right. Um. I wrote in my notes last week, and again, when I read this chapter, I was thinking more along the lines of the Bar Hu prayer, specifically the last line when it says, when I call in the light of my soul, I come home. Hmm. That returning, and that's my favorite prayer, because the it's a reminder for me, remember who you are, whoever that is. So high holidays, uh, what's the, when you put a square or a, or a exponential. Mm -hmm. So high holidays for me takes that idea and, and uh, enhances it in an exponent, 
exponential, exponential, exponential. Uh, no, you're yeah, right. you got way. Um, I get in the most trouble when I do things against what feels comfortable. Mm -hmm. So if I'm veering that far away from whoever my real self is, my my job is to come back to come back to home base, mm -hmm. get a lay of the land, and then set out again. And 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 to be comfortable with whatever the conditions are when I look out at the field, to use your baseball analogy. <laughs> yeah, that is the field of dreams. Dan. And yeah. So thank you, Linda. Um, yeah, you know, you mentioned the word journey, and I always think of a journey as moving forward, progress as we grow and build our lives. Uh, so as you know and not a return. So you used the term journey in terms of returning. Um, and so it just, it's difficult for me to, to mesh those two, um, unless I think about what you're talking about, the teshuva stuff, returning home, is to free myself of the crapola that's built up, like you said, the mud, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and to restart my journey free of the free of the crap all of that but not to lose the good stuff the growth but just to let go of the crap all absolutely yeah actually Reb Zalman talked all the time about uh, Rosh Hashanah being a time for installing a new operating system right but yeah. reminding us that all of the old information still remains you know a, a click away <laughs> right the, just uh installing a new operating system does not Everything is running in the background, all of our crap, like you would say, Dan, you know, all of the stuff that we carry with us, we try and, and it can be at any time, uh, rear its ugly head. Um, and those are the habits the, and the habitual, beha the habitual behavior um, that uh, we fall trapped to uh, unless we are so intentional about the way that we live that we create um, breaks uh, around that. Uh, an ability to say, oh, here that is, here here it comes again. I'm not going to walk down that road. And <clears throat> for those of you who remember me using autobiography in five chapters, I'll be using that in uh, in a future week too, um, uh, about not taking the same, <laughs> taking a different path. Meira, and then uh, Neil, I saw you, Neil. So um, I read in, in, in that chapter that it's intense self-revelation and purification. Estrangement from God brings us closer to God. And yeah. part of part of um, part of this time of the year is that I um, I use the summer to kind of as a refreshment, as a as a lightness, as a less maybe less serious, but you know just. Um, more able to be more on the on the surface or well present, but not necessarily. But I feel a great yearning when it starts to get closer to the high holidays that I want to have a, a level of depth and a level of intimacy and a level of 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 um, of of really looking within that I didn't feel in the summertime. And it, it just seems almost like intuitive to me mm -hmm. to feel that way. And that's why I appreciate this opportunity to study. Thank you. Wonderful, you're very welcome. Neil, did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, I, uh, I, I like this quote on, which is on page 23. It says, the truth is every time we come home, home is different. And so are we. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's some truth. Absolutely. We're, we're transformed by the journey. How can if, we not if be? We weren't, we're not paying much attention and we're certainly not living an intentional life um, where, we, um, where we are seeking to grow spiritually, seeking to grow yeah. in relationship to each other and with the divinity. And, then ultimately really more with ourselves. Yeah, I underlined that one. Yeah, great. Uh, page 25. I'm going to see you, Soloveitchik's language. Please excuse the genders, the gendered language. 
When man sins, we're on page 25. When man sins, he creates a distance between himself and God. To sin means to remove oneself from the presence of the master of the universe. I was standing before you and sin came and estranged me from you and I no longer feel that I am before you. The whole essence of the precept of repentance is longing, repentance, right? Longing, pining, yearning. You were just talking about that um, era. To pining to return again. Longing develops only when one has lost something precious. Sin pushes us far away and stimulates our longing to return. This is why Rambam, that's Maimonides, wrote, how powerful is repentance for it brings man closer to the presence of God. So I'm wondering here whether he's referring to when he says that I am, I no longer feel that I am before you, if we are um, instructed, Shiviti Adonai Negdi Tamid, right? To place Yudhe Vave before us always. Um, if, we, uh, if we're lost, you know, if we're lost, um, we uh, we feel estranged and we feel distant from. So, but you know, he's throwing the word, <laughs> not throwing the word, but he's using the word sin here, you know, hate. Um, and I'm not sure I ultimately, I, I, under, I understand for myself what it is when I do it and what it results in, which is that schmutz that you were talking about, Dan, I call it cosmic schmutz. Um, There is a story that I'm sure you've heard, because I've told it and Renee has told it many times, um, that um, when we are uh, born, each of us is born with a string attached between us and divinity, right? From umbilically, from us to, to God. And that when we commit a uh, hate, a sin, whether it be uh, by omission or commission, um, the string is cut. But when we do, which causes a breakage, right? But when we do teshuvah, the string is reattached. It, there, a knot is made in that place. So in essence, what happens is because we're only human, the, the cut happens again and again and again, but each which at first separates ourselves from divinity, distances ourselves, but then each time we do teshuvah, so each time we quote unquote repent, whatever that is, you know, however we do that, the string becomes shorter because the knots have created a shorter string, right? And so in essence, we are then cl even closer to divinity than we were at work. So when, when Rambam says that, that teshuvah is powerful, it, because it brings us closer to the presence of God, just use that image, that that is what is happening uh, for us when we mend a relationship. You know, when we say, I'm sorry, and God knows, and we know that the hardest kind of uh, to show what to do is with our own selves, to forgive ourselves for those things that we have committed either by omission or commission. Oh, I could have, I should have, I right? If I'd only gone this way and not that way, if I'd only listened to this person, if I'd only practiced the piano more, <laughs> Or if I'd only used the last, you know, last two and a half years of uh, of the pandemic to practice the guitar more. When I was uh, first moved to Washington, I started taking piano lessons um, from a professional uh, piano player named John Eaton, and John is like a, a really the height of his profession. And uh, after a couple of lessons, uh, he thought I was doing really, really well. And, um, and he turned to me and he says, you know, give it 10 years. You could be a really, really good pianist. <laughs> what? But he was right. If I had started then, of course, my life took other wonderful, wonderful directions. And I'm, I'm not sorry, but we all have those kinds of if we had, if thens, right? 
and the reward that maybe we would have had, but maybe we wouldn't be where we are right now for all its beauty and all of um, all that we have to offer. All right, where am I? Page 23, we just did Salavechik. Page 24, Primal Jester. Page 25. Okay, what happened here? I don't know what it's 25 because I lost my my underscore and my Kindle. Presence of God, string here. Oh, that I did already. Good, sir. Okay. Because I know some of you are just dying to get to more baseball. Let's turn to page 27. I find this story very moving every time I read it. Um, uh, I, th this ball player, uh, Dwight Gooden, he was a phenomena uh, for the Mets. And uh, he came up when he was uh, 19 and he took the baseball by storm. Um, what happened though was, uh, you know, he, 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 he came a little too close to the sun and, uh, and fame and drugs, uh, eventually got the best of him. Um, so he talks about, um, where's this going to do, do he, oh, he's coming from somebody else's story, but I don't remember what that was. Because a short while later, I read a newspaper story about Dwight Gooden, the baseball player. Dwight Gooden had just come back from the dead, so to speak, after one of the most brilliant beginnings in the history of baseball. His career had gone down in a maelstrom of premature fame, drug involvement, and denial. Then he righted himself, beat his problem, matured as a human being, returned to baseball and even to New York to pitch again, this time for the Yankees. So he started out with the Mets, but then he, he went and pitched for the Yankees. And after a period of struggle, he found his way back to a rhythm of sorts and became a capable pitcher for the Yankees. Now, notice he didn't become a great, great, you know, star pitcher, but he became a capable pitcher. There was always about him the weight of his lost potential, what he could have become but did not. But there were flashes of his early brilliance, too. And finally, he pitched the first no hitter of his career, his father whose heart had ached to see Gooden suffer so after a brilliant beginning, now lay dying in the hospital in St. Petersburg, Florida. The day after the no-hitter, Dwight Gooden flew back home to Florida to give his father the ball he had pitched it with. He said he owed it to his father for all the days when he was a kid and his father would take him out to the fields to throw a ball back and forth with him. I think one of the things we learn in the course of the long journey home is to keep our eye on the ball on the starting point, on the things in life that are essential that sustain us. One of the ways our lives heal us is to teach us this. So on a personal note, one of the reasons I always find this such a powerful story, um, as many of you know, this was my relationship with my dad. And uh, you know, had playing catch uh, on the side of the house and um, him encouraged me to play baseball and taking me to Yankee games. And so me, like many men of my generation, at the end of Field of Dreams, which I know many of you have seen, and um, that's when I start weeping because that's my dad, and I'm playing catch with my dad. And there is something about um, those essential things that remain with us, um, when, especially from when we were kids. But what about those essential things before we even that are essential to our neshamot, right? That are essential to our souls and our soul's journey, which is why contemplative work is so, so important um, to have a contemplative practice because it allows us to sit in that space of nothing, no thingness, to allow that which is hidden to be revealed. And, and so the whole idea of sin um, to me, that's, that's, that's what hides, you know, the neshama. It's like, and you've heard me say this before, um, it's like shmos on the windshield of a car, right? You can't see clearly ahead, but you also can't see back. And, you know, we were talking a couple of weeks ago at, uh, on a Shabbos morning about looking through the rear view mirror, right? So we need to know where we come from, too, to know where we're going. But we also need to have a practice where we breathe into presence and everything gets pruned away except for your Eunice, right? Eunice. I found a nice quote by Alan Marinus this week. You know, Alan Marinus is a major figure in 
<laughs> I just had a, my brain. I just went black. And Musar, right? I, I, I watched your lips, Sarah Sandy. <laughs> Alma Rhinus quote: "The soul needs silence as the body needs sleep. The soul needs silence as the body needs sleep." It's just a natural part of our, 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 our rest and our sleep and, and movement cycles for the body. And the soul needs it too in order to, to refresh itself and to shine as um, it was intended to, to do. This too is what teshuva um, results in. Um, I never thought of this before, all the spiritual directors in the group, um, that uh, in a way we're kind of leading or we're companioning our um, you know, our direct D's um, on a path of teshuva, of of of, of reclaiming, of re of coming home to their you know uh, to, to to who they are, to their what they've been called to, in that by that still small voice, you know, to quote Rosh Hashanah um, and Yom Kippur. Uh, liturgy. Mira Bracha, I saw your hand up. I think I'm muted. Am I muted? No, I can hear you. I can hear you. Now you're muted. The opposite. Okay. So I've been sitting here absorbing all of this. And when you started talking about, you asked about when we were young, did, did our families have a head of a something on the table to eat. And, and for me, that was absolutely not, not something that my family had. We had regular big dinners for Rosh Hashanah. But then it took me, my memory took me into the synagogue that I grew up in, where children were sent out of the sanctuary at the time of Yisker, mm -hmm. which I think is a pretty common yep. habit. And I have a cousin who's a couple of years older than I am, who lost her father when she was a very young child. Mm -hmm. And I can't remember now whether they let her come into the ISCRA service or not. But I, I had a loss when I was a young child. And I was sent out of the sanctuary. And I felt lost. And for many, many years, even after growing up, I, I felt there was something missing in my life about the high holidays. And when I read about how there are people who on the high holidays prostrate, prostrate, prostrate themselves during the Elena, is it the Elena? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I started doing that. And that for me was a real, is a real coming home and making amends for whatever I thought I did or whether I did do. And it fills my heart mm. and brings me to tears. Mm. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, for those of you who uh, are unfamiliar with the practice, usually if you go to shul, it's the, it's the rabbi and the chazam and the cantor who are prostrating themselves during Aleinu. And also later on during the Abu Dhabi service on Yom Kippur, um, the Shaliyah board does that as well. Um, but uh, if you've never done it, it's an amazingly powerful asana. You know, it's an amazingly powerful pose of complete submission and to, um, to, to, to experiencing that, uh, it's very powerful. Um, thank you, Mayor Brock, for saying, yeah, it's, it, it, when I, I, we were kids, it was not, never a practice of anybody except for the rabbi and the cantor to do that. And sometimes just the cantor, the rabbi was in charge of helping the cantor get to his feet, <laughs> right? Because at that time on Yom Kippur, you're starting to get a little schwach you know, and uh, you're worried about getting up. But uh, these days, you know, get into the aisle, or if you're, you know, if we're, if we, if we're together, um, God willing, some of us will be together for over the high holidays um, in our Zoom agog. Um, I'm gonna encourage you to find the space to do that. Um, and I'm not gonna get into talking too much about um, what I have in mind for our um, 
most shy holiday experience, but just as a teaser, it's, there's going to be a lot of listening involved, and that's going to be my theme uh, as a through line. Teshuva. No, I'm sorry. Uh, oh, oh, oh I, I did want to remember to mention one thing. Um, for me, baseball is what Reb Zalman would call a root metaphor, my root metaphor. All right. So I latch onto that very, very easily because it's just ingrained in me. And, uh, you know, when I, when I'm watching baseball, my father's with me. And when I'm davening, my father's with me. And this is all just like so, so important to, um, to my kavanah and my ability to serve as well. Um, and so if each of us has uh, a root metaphor, um, in our lives that, uh, either for the, the good, um, to remind us of who we are, or sometimes uh, we, we, we give in to the, the worst, our worst instincts, uh, to addiction um, and the like. And that becomes the metaphor of our lives, chasa chalila, that applies to anyone here right now. But to Shuva on page 28, he says, death, the destination of our journey through life also heals. All right. Teshuvah is the little death that connects us to the big one, or as Rambam says, the repentance should change his name as if to say, I am another. I'm not the same person who did these deeds. It is as if that person has died. This is why this day resembles a dress rehearsal for our death, of course, referring to Yom Kippur. And before I get, I also wanted to, to just remind us all that teshuva, it's, it's not just for Rosh Hashanah anymore, <laughs> for Elul anymore. I mean, that was a commercial of some kind, I don't know what it was. But um, in our daily prayers, we have a moment to express that we, and, and, to, and to beat our chest, right? In the same way that we do on Yom Kippur, um, on a daily basis. And so... This, too, is built into the cyclical nature, not only of the entire calendar, but the entire day, day to day, all leading us to Shabbat, where that prayer does not appear. That's part of the, the daily prayer service. Uh, did I see a hand up or continue? Okay. Ah. Uh. A instrument of our healing time. I don't know where I saw this, but I made a note. Well, let's look at page 28. Um, Yom Kippur is the day we all get to read our own obituary. And by the way, if you've never done it, you should do it. I think we did it in Hashpa'ah training as part of the program. Yes? Yeah. Wow. That's really powerful. Write your own obit. It's an important part of aging and saging work, you know, as we um, are, are harvesting what we want to leave behind that's of, you know, most important, you know, the real ikar, the essence of our lives. Um, this is one of the really important exercises to do, um, along with everything, everything else, but it's kind of fun too. You kind of, you kind of get to play um, Tom Sawyer, right? It wasn't a Tom Sawyer who came back for his own funeral. Anybody? Yes, Gail Garland. Yes, thank you, Judy. <laughs> it's been a long time. But I didn't remember if it was him or Huck, but I, I, I was sure it was Tom Sawyer. You know, the great, the day we get to read our own obit. It's a dress rehearsal for our death. That's why we wear a kittle. By the way, this is my last baseball. Uh, years ago, I was um, led family services at Olam Tikva in um, in Fairfax County, which is where um, Mary Gail and I met. So, so many years ago, late 1980s. And um, I led family services and I was wearing a Kittle. And the Baltimore Orioles had a left fielder by the name of Ron Kittle. And so I had two different baseball references to offer that day. First of all, that this Kittle I was wearing was not the Kittle that played for the Orioles. And it was also Shabbos. And so on Shabbos in a conservative shul, we were not blowing shofar. And so the last baseball reference, I promise, I made the comment that going to shul on Rosh Hashanah and not hearing the shofar is like going to see the Baltimore Orioles and Cal Ripken is not in the lineup. OK, 
Okay, a couple of you got it. Okay. Cal Ripken played more games in a row than Luke Berry. He played that record. So we were a kid, a shroud-like garment on this day. Why we refrain from life-affirming activities such as eating, drinking, and procreating. We were rehearsing the day of our death because death, like Yom Kippur, atones. This is a little-known teaching from the Talmud. You don't even have to go to shul. <laughs> Just immersing, immersing ourselves. The fact that it's Yom Kippur atones for our sins. I mean, that is pretty darn powerful that on this day, of course, you got to do all the work before Yom Kippur, but <laughs> the banks of the river roll by, we leave home to return home. Loss is inevitable. Entropy is a fact of life. What's done cannot be undone, but it can be healed. It can even become the instrument of our healing. I, I, for me, that's like the Broadway um, you know, flashing lights of this chapter. What's done cannot be done, but it can be healed. It can even become the instrument of our healing, which is what I was trying to refer to before, Reb Sarah. All right. I know someone right now who's going through a terrible time in his life and um, just can't move on because he, he wants to undo a decision he made two two weeks ago or a decisions he made two months ago or two years ago and we can't roll back that but how to what is the spiritual practices that in that enable us to do this to heal what cannot be undone right it might be a um worthy worthwhile just to bookmark this moment um, because we're going to be doing a lot of writing in the weeks ahead when we um, get fully into the practicing of teshuva of things in your life you wish you could undo you know we all could write chapters and chapters and chapters of things we things we wish we hadn't said that actions we should wish we wouldn't have taken Right. Bina. Sorry, I just wanted to remind you that everything that comes out of Alan's mouth is based also in his Zen Buddhism practice. Absolutely. So, so I just wanted to say, you know, in the book at the bottom of page 29, he, he says the passage of time brings awareness and the two together, time and consciousness. You know, he's 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 a great teacher about wake up and see what's going on. So I just yes. wanted to re remind about that. Yeah, that's a, also a major theme throughout the whole book is waking, waking up. And I have in my notes, time plus consciousness equals healing. So thank you for, for pointing that out, because that is I mean, where he's coming from. He's managed to, uh, you know, he wrote the book, the, the, the Sound of One Hand Clapping. Was that the name of the book? Right. Um, so that's he, he's immersed in that world, um, and we have <coughs> all have a lot to learn um, from other spiritual traditions as well. <laughs> Certainly, some of which, <coughs> excuse me, we are as well immersed in <coughs> the thrall of the material world. Page thirty. The thrall of the material world begins to lose its hold on us, and the objects in our life begin to fall away. It becomes increasingly clear that those things which are the least solid, the least material, the least substantial, last the longest, have the greatest effect, and in the end are the only things we leave behind. So this has echoes of writing an ethical will, right? Of what it is that we want to leave behind. Um, as things become, as, as material things become less and less important, I know certainly that's happening for me. Um, I suspect there'll come a time, um, <laughs> a friend of mine um, said to me, uh, and I know it's true, the greatest gift we can give our children is to get rid of all that crap in the house now. <laughs> right? It's in the attic. It's in the closets, right? So that they don't have to deal with it all. And then they, they have you, you know, they, they don't have to go through all of that stuff. Bina, you saw your hand up? Did you, did you, okay. Put your hand down. 
what did I wonder? Okay. Yeah. Uh, in that story about Rabbi um, Laura Geller, the passage of time had reduced her to her essential nature. I said, do you feel that happening? I feel it happening for me. Um, maybe not fast enough, but I can't control that. Um, you know, I wish I, I knew, you know, all the time. I wish I was in a Shiviti state all the time, that I, I knew who I was and I acted upon that, <laughs> and that I was kind 24-7, not only to others, but to myself. High holidays are dress rehearsal for life, for death, when we're all stripped down, a time that gives us the intimation of what this long, strange journey home is all about, which of course always delights me when I get to that, because it reminds me of what a long, strange trip it's been. Right? If I knew the way, I would take you home. It's like, <laughs> There's only one story. I mean, let's admit it. There's one long love story between that which yearned to be in relationship with us. And I'm talking about yud hei vav -Hey, breathing life into us so that we could walk this path along this magical journey and calendar that has been set out for us. I mean, there's so many parts of this chapter that uh, you know. I read through and I said, yeah, yeah, yes. Like we say that all the time, our home is a river, <laughs> right? <laughs> what is it we sing every Wednesday afternoon? Debra? I would love to live like the river flows. I would, the Don John um, O'Donoghue quote. Right? I would love to live like the river flows, carried by the surprise of its own surprise unfolding. Its own there is a lot of letting go that one has to do in order to to do that. To do, it. but he's yearning for it, and I think that, my holy friends, is really um, what Alan Liu is trying to teach us, reteach us, is that what comes first is the yearning. Right, the yearning to return, the yearning to yearning to be whole, the yearning to make amends, to say I'm sorry and that I promise not to do that or say that again. The day of Yom Kippur itself atones. The journey through time, which surrounds it, heals. If you open yourself to them, these holy days carry you home. So that's the last line of um, of chapter two as we start to come in for a landing here. <clears throat> um, the risk of, um, the risk of, I don't think any of you are gonna feel um, intimidated nor um, embarrassed. I would love us to go around and share a midah, Share a characteristic, something about yourself that you recognize as eternal, something that has embraced, has, has clung to you. You know, that's your dvekut point um, that you lean into. What is it that uh, an essential, what's essentially you? Just one, one word. Now, it, it could be many, many words, of course to describe that. Um, but let's just go around um, and share with each other um, a characteristic, a midah, um, that you recognize as really being essentially and eternally you. It, I, I, and I'm emphasizing the word eternally. Um, when I was a kid, um, I used to s sing all the time. I'm waiting for the bus, and, you know, making my way places. And I, I, I don't, so I don't take any credit for this. Um, I, I'm very, um, uh, I'm filled with gratitude that this is the way that I was hardwired. Um, 
and uh, and that I was able to recognize it because I grew up um, in a in a home that was musical, and my parents nurtured it and nourished it, and uh, and I helped to cultivate it as well. But I recognize that that's one of my root, you know, that's one of my midot is creativity, uh, and uh, and imagination. Um, so I'm curious uh, the kinds of things that you have to share. One or two words. You can just unmute yourself. Dan, go ahead. Curiosity. And I'm going to say amen after each of us goes. And if you would like to do that either out loud or with a motion, amen. Mary Rita. Loving kindness. Amen. Mel. Funny. Amen. Da David, do you have your hand up? Kana. Compassionate. Say it again. Compassionate. Amen. Boundless. Yeah. Connection. Yeah, Connection. Connection. Amen. Kesher. Supportive to others. Who is that? Me, Lori. Hi, Lori. Thank you. Amen. Neil. Yeah. Caring. Amen. Jennifer. Warmth. Amen. Renee and then Deborah. Wandering into unknown territory. Amen. Deborah and then Roxanne. Searching. Roxanne and then Meira. Singing. Loving. Linda. Responsible. Thank you. Mary, did you say loving? Oh, go ahead then. Um, lo loving nature. Loving, Amen. reverent nature. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Bina. Joyful creativity. Amen. Uh, Mayor Bracha. Patience. Amen. Anybody else who hasn't gone yet? Rev Dev. Trailblazer. Say again. Trailblazer. Amen. Miriam. Like to make people happy. Amen. I think that's everybody went. Boy, you put us all together. We're one amazing human being. Oh, Ripsara, did you say something? Would you like uh, to? Service to others. Mm, amen, amen. So, you know, when uh, when Moshe Rabbeinu begs to uh, see God's face, and Yote Babi says, oh, you can't see my face, but uh, hide in that cleft and all my goodness shall pass before you. And then all of the midot, you know, pass. Um, it feels like a one giant, uh, you know, smorgasbord of possibilities in which all of which are embedded in us, but some of which, or maybe one or two of which, are really a part of our unique, uh, 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 what's the word, um, nekuda, you know, our, our, our point, the point of, uh, that that's embedded so deep within that's where we shine from right and that's when we're most alive too so when you are uh, um when we are engaged in anything of service loving kindness compassion of uh, being with nature that's when we feel closest to our source to closest to god and so we have to remember to do those things how easy well uh, and, and and how sad it is when we forget who we are and we and we realize, oh my gosh, I haven't gone to Brock Creek Park in like two months, you know? I haven't gone for a walk. I haven't created solitude for myself. I, I haven't gone to my favorite place to what the, the river run by, you know, that's so nourishing, you know? I haven't done any volunteer work. I have, I, and, and these things that we get caught up in life, they ha it happens that we, 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 um, we oftentimes, you know, just forget, but then, what happens, I think, is that that's when we feel the estrangement, right, from ourselves and from and from God. And so the process of teshuvah also can happen 
in the things that we do, in the practices, the spiritual practices of caring for each other, right? Caring for one another, of listening very deeply to another human being, for, for singing, for for, for for loving to cook for one's family, right? All of these things, um, when we do them, you know, all, all comes back to kavana, all comes back with in, to intention. If we do things with intention, which is why we say a bracha for, for everything, right? It's, it's Jewish intentional practice, you know, Jewish mindfulness practice. It all leads to a stronger connection and then another little, um, not in that um, string that we are tied to God with for all time. All right, my holy friends. Um, we're coming in for a landing here. Uh, anyone have any questions from the chapter or anything that rises up from you? Uh, the, that just feels like the, something that you'd like to share right now. Give a moment, Miriam, and what a how, what a joy it is uh, to have you with us. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It seems to me the schmutz that we've been talking about is self protective. Mm -hmm. uh, this chapter was very powerful for me, and I and I uh, when I read it first last year, I, I earmarked it. Is that we go, we get stuck at the place of childhood in which there was trauma. Yes. And when there's trauma, you try to protect yourself and that protection distances you. So yeah. that's just something I wanted to share. Yeah, absolutely. And um, let me by no means uh, come across as saying any of this is easy, especially if one has um, had trauma in her or his life or their life, um, that the, the, the process of the shuva um, can uh, bring up things we haven't dealt with in a long time and uh, that we should make sure that we either have um, you know a therapist to work with or we, who will lend us an ear or certainly a or, or a spiritual companion doesn't have to be a spiritual director but just someone who um, who can incline their ear you know that expression uh, in Torah that God inclines God's ear toward to us um, if we feel that we're being that we're heard, um, this is my sense, um, that if we feel that we are being heard and seen, that lends itself to a, a kind of a healing that's almost mikvah-like, right? Bina, so thank you for raising that, uh, Miriam. Bina? Yes, I'm just remembering how Reb Zalman used to talk about tshuva as a daily, weekly, monthly, not just a yearly, right? And that was yeah. so transformative for me to think about the nighttime Shema being tshuva time, that you know you have this opportunity every single day to kind of leave this stuff behind you. And we just don't often take advantage of that. Yeah, yeah. Rip Sarah. Uh, oh, thank you for that. Uh, he, Rip Zalman wrote an essay, didn't he, on a Yom Kippur Katan? Yes. And how we do Yom Kippur Katan on a daily, as Bina said, a daily, weekly basis. Yeah, Katan meaning small, like a small, little Yom, thank Yom Kippur. You. Yom Kippur Katan, yes. Yeah. yeah, he has a little pamphlet on that. Can we, Can people get it, Mark? Uh, I suspect it's still available. I don't know. They'd have okay. to check with the in the Aleph office, or I'm sure Rev. Daniel knows the, the Canadian. They have a lot of stuff up in Canada. That yeah, I got <laughs> Mary Rita. It. I got it through the Canadian website. Ah, okay. You probably can get, even get these days a digital copy of it. So if you go to Al Aleph Canada, yeah, um, I got you, digital. you might find a copy of that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. We're good. Let's end with a song. But how about any, um, all right, let's, let's, let's end with, ah, okay. <laughs> There's all these songs going through my head. Hashiveinu, Hashiveinu, Adonai Lecha, 
ashireinu ashireinu adonai lecha venashuva venashuva Yameinu kekedem Chadesh, Chadesh Yameinu kekedem Laila Tov, everyone, and Yes, I did.